Hi, just a couple notes real quick. We, there was a mistake while uploading the episode last week that should be fixed now. Secondly, this is the first episode of our second recording session, so you should notice a decent jump in quality from what's been there so far. Next week, there's going to be a little bonus episode that we're going to record uh, the day after this goes up. Um, don't forget to send us email feedback at thegreatstodate at gmail.com. And finally, thanks for listening. Oh, you know what? I have good news. Good news. So the good news is that there are still crickets outside my window. They are significantly quieter today. Because, well, I shouldn't say today. I should say I'm in a new place, and this new place has quieter crickets. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's my good news. And with that... Hey Trevor, how's it going? It's going pretty well. How are you? Uh, can't complain. Can't complain. All right. So today we're going to talk about Alexander. Alec Sander. Alexander. That's how they say it in English. Okay. Yeah, I see how precisely you're pronouncing his name. <laughs> Def- definitely not how the Greeks did, which was uh, Alejandros. Well, and I mean, nobody's going to agree with them, so that's fine. <laughs> First thing on on the outline is Philip II. So Philip II is Alexander the Great's father. Okay. So Philip II was, of course, a Macedonian king. Macedonia is uh, north of what we would call Greece, but still mostly Greek. Uh, a-, a Greek country larger than a city state more powerful than a city state okay uh philip ii wanted macedon to be even greater than that he wanted to control all of greece and he had a great opportunity in the decades before um philip took power in macedon the peloponnesian war had taken place so at so the greek city states were uh divided against themselves and against each other The Athenians, Mm -hmm. who had lost the Peloponnesian War, were trying to rebuild their empire, and the Spartans and the Thebans were holding them down and fighting against them, um, but not allied with each other. So they were also fighting against each other. So Greece was Mm. very, very not united at this time. Okay. Okay, yeah. Right. Sounds like a bit of a free-for-all. It it was a bit of a free-for-all, and that's exactly what uh, Philip II took advantage of. And he set out a conquering and captured most of Greece. He was he was unable to grab um, Sparta, actually. The Spartans held out against the Macedonians for um, <laughs> like another decade after Alexander uh, took power. Now, I mean, you might not know the answer to this question, but when the Greeks were preparing for the Battle of Thermopylae and the impeding Persian conquest... Was it just because they knew that the conquest was coming that they were able to set aside their differences and all ally? Or did they think that Philip II was a weaker enemy or what? Philip II was Greek. So not the, the definition of Greece changes a lot over time. But to us today, he was Greek. He spoke Greek. Okay. He was part of the greater Greek culture. Um, okay. So this was not an external threat threatening to uh, conquer them all. He was someone from the inside, and so inherently less unite against Okay. I'm a linguist, so all I'm right. allowed to make up words like that. I mean, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> a linguist would say that any word you make up is a word, right? That's right. And so uh, I... I have been using the Roman historian Plutarch, who was uh, one of the first and greatest biographers of history. Um, And so his primary goal was telling the story of Alexander. So Philip II kind of gets glossed over a bit, except for at the very beginning of the story. So yeah, going straight to the source. I try to be a bit more thorough. I I like looking at source text and... Yeah. Uh, summarizing things from a summary of a summary, which is what Wikipedia is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, technically speaking, Plutarch is still a summary, but it's an ancient summary, so it's not that bad. It might as well be a primary source. Yeah. Um, speaking of sources, uh, 
it should be noted that Plutarch himself was a, a historian who lived after the fact. So his he used lots of different sources for his own work. We don't have all of the sources that Plutarch has. That that's why make that makes Plutarch himself a good source is that he had all these documents that we don't including one of Alexander's personal diaries. Really? Yeah. It was it, it was about uh 300ish years afterwards. So I guess it's it's normal yeah. for documents to last 300 years. All right. So surrounding Alexander's birth, that this event is um was probably nothing all that special at the time, but Alexander was not averse to using propaganda. So the stories that we have of it are kind of mythical. Uh, So supposedly, around the time that he was conceived, while no one thought uh, significantly of it at the time for some reason, his mother was struck by a thunderbolt, which becomes very important later, supposedly. Yeah, because, I mean, the first thing to come to mind is Zeus, right? Right. So uh, later in life, Alexander is told that Philip is not his father. He is the son of Zeus. Hmm, okay. Or, well, that's what he tells people that he was told. Yes. So th- there is something interesting around the circumstances of Alexander's birth, and that is it happened on exactly the same day as okay. the destruction of the Temple of Artemis. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. So um, I love the words that Plutarch uses here. There was one of uh, Philip's friends um, made, in Plutarch's words, a ponderous joke dull enough to have put out the fire which was that it was no wonder that the temple of artemis was burned since she was away from it attending the birth of alexander <laughs> <laughs> i like that i like that it's 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 a it's a silly joke apparently just as silly at the time so in addition uh the the persian magi who were at Ephesus that day that the temple was burned, said that um, that it was the forerunner of a much greater disaster, and they would run through the city, beating their faces and saying that born on this day is the destroyer of Asia. What? Yeah, apparently that that, that that's supposedly that's what the Persian Magi were saying. Mm, yeah. I don't know. I'm a bit skeptical, too. Makes for a good story, though, I suppose. Yep. Um, and th- there's one more bit of the story in that uh, Philip received uh, three messengers that day. The first one told him of the victory over the Illyrians uh, at Parmenio. The-, the second messenger was that Philip's racehorse had won a victory at Olympia. And the third was that Alexander was born. And he was very delighted okay. at the good news of three great victories for him. And the soothsayers told him mm-hmm. that his son, because his birth coincided with three victories, he would prove invincible. Okay. That's kind of some of the backstory here for Alexander's birth. So he grew up in the purple as att- attending his father's various campaigns. He commanded a few. He put down a revolt in Thrace. And established a city there Uh, named Alexandropolis, not to be confused with the modern city, Alexandrupolis, which was named after Alexander II, who was a king of Greece in the 20s. Uh, So in Alexander's uh, young adulthood, there's this famous story where a Thessalian man brought Philip a horse named Bucephalus. Okay. When so Philip and his friends, they went to some level ground and they were going to put this horse through the paces, you know. And the horse was unmanageable. It was easily distressed and it wouldn't allow itself to be ridden. And Alexander, who was there, said, What a fine horse they're ruining because they're too ignorant and cowardly to manage him. After Alexander said this several times, Philip said, Well, uh, why don't you go uh, handle the horse then? And Alexander said, I could manage this horse better than anyone else. And And Philip said, Okay, so if you can't, what penalty will you pay for it? And Alexander says, I'll buy the horse. 
So everybody was laughing and they're setting up the terms for this wager. And Alexander, he just ran right up to the horse, took him by the bridle and turned him towards the sun. Because he noticed that the horse was dancing and uh, he was afraid of his own shadow. Oh. And he talked to the horse, patted him on the head, and uh, waited until he wasn't snorting so wildly. And then he jumped on his back and reined him in and rode him with no trouble. And how old was Alexander at the time? Uh, we don't have an age. Okay, but this is this is when he's young. He he is young at this time, yeah. That's awesome. Very perceptive. Very. So afterwards, after Alexander rode around for a bit and got off the horse, Philip told him, My son, seek for a kingdom worthy of yourself, for Macedonia will not hold you. Hmm? So there's a lot of this of uh, uh, foreshadowing in the legend of alexander how everybody knew that he was going to be great we, obviously looking back in history we don't know for sure that all of these things were actually said exactly but the fact that there are so many of them indicates that th- there was something special about him from the beginning that makes sense mm-hmm. hopefully not too much of it was retrospective you know hopefully not too much but uh if if, if there are yeah. enough stories of people talking about him as uh, significant in his youth, then he probably was at least a little bit notable. Um, besides, you know, being part of the royal family. Yeah, I agree. Fairly well known that Philip hired the great philosopher Aristotle to be Alexander's personal tutor. Yep. And Alexander really used to uh, love and admire Aristotle. There are some that say uh, that he loved Aristotle more than his father. Okay. Plutarch writes of some letters that exists between philip and aristotle i'm sorry not philip and aristotle alexander and aristotle there we go yeah and in particular there was one where aristotle announced the publication of his work the metaphysic okay alexander objected to it he he said don't tell everybody your secrets and this high philosophy they're not ready for it and to which uh, aristotle famously replied His stories were published and at the same time not published because nobody would be able to understand the metaphysics without having been trained in philosophy by Aristotle, that it was would be useless to um, anyone else. So so why publish it then? That's an excellent question. I'm not sure why he would want want to publish it, except maybe to ensure that uh, the the knowledge contained within wouldn't be totally lost. That makes sense. Yeah. So, yes. So when Alexander was 16, he was, for the first time, given control of the kingdom while his father was um, besieging the city of Byzantium. This is the time when he defeated the uh, Median rebels, not to be confused with the other Medians in Persia. This is a different I, I city definitely would have confused in Greece. Them. Yeah. It, they're, they're in eastern Macedonia. He defeated them captured their city, threw out all the barbarians, and reconstituted it as a Greek colony and named it Alexandropolis. So that is that is the the Alexandropolis that we were talking about earlier. So there there were some shenanigans between uh the the Philip and Alexander and the Macedonian uh royal court and that of Pixadarus, the satrap of Caria, which was a Persian kingdom in modern-day Turkey, so Anatolia. And Caria had hoped to connect himself with Philip, and so offered his daughter in marriage. Philip just outright uh, ignored it, and some of the other people whose names I won't mention didn't like that. They got in trouble, and they assassinated Philip uh, in retaliation. So Alexander immediately sought out the conspirators of this plot and had them all killed. Or actually, he had them cruelly tortured and put to death. Cruelly tortured? By his mother. Okay. So that resulted in Alexander rising to the throne of Macedonia at age 20. Okay. After Alexander took over from his father there were a series of uprisings in Greece, most notably in Thebes. That is the Greek city of Thebes, not the Egyptian city of Thebes. So Alexander set out. He wiped out the rebels pretty quickly, captured, plundered, and destroyed the city. Goodness gracious. 30,000 of Thebans were sold into slavery, with uh, the exception of a handful of priests, Alexander's friends, and those who publicly opposed the revolt. 30,000. Yeah. Um, However, after he captured Thebes... He was a lot more lenient with the Athenians, 
um, even though they accepted Theban refugees and showed some sympathy for them. And um, so uh, Plutarch thinks that either he wanted to contrast his viciousness with mercy, or else he was just tired of fighting when, or his wrath was sated or something like that. He wound up actually t telling the Athenians that he did not have a quarrel with them, and he told them that they might rule Greece again if they played their cards right, which, of course, made the Athenians very happy and gained him their allegiance. Okay. Um, although concerning Thebes, it is afterwards said that Alexander often talked about how much he regretted his conduct and his treatment of the uh, rebellious Thebans. Okay, when he sold 30,000 yeah. in slavery. Right. Okay. So once his uh, hold on Greece was secure, Alexander set his sights on Persia, and he called a council and the Greek city-states were behind him, and he went to the Oracle to consult the god about his campaign. Oracle of Delphi? That's right. Yep, none other? Well, uh, there are some others, and there's actually one other that will play a part in our story. Ooh, good. So, But he got there on one of the days that are called unfortunate, meaning the oracle is not able to give a response to requests, hmm. but he entered the temple by force anyway. By force? Yeah, by force. He found the oracle and dragged her to the prophetic tripod, and the oracle said, you are irresistible, my son, at which Alexander dropped her and left, saying that that's the response he wanted. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, so he crossed the Hellespont, and he found a large Persian force preparing for him at uh, the River Granicus. So um, the Persian ruler himself was not there, but there were a handful of satraps and some local governors and such like that. His generals at this point suggested that he turn back because this battlefield was not favorable for the Greeks. But Alexander insisted, and he personally led the charge across the river. Um, he was almost killed himself, but was rescued by some of his generals that I won't bother you with the names of. Alexander's attack gave his phalanx enough time to cross the river and push against the Theban forces, making them run away, and lots of them were slaughtered as the Macedonians gave chase. And this battle alone won Alexander most of Asia Minor. Wow, that's a that's a big battle. Now, now why was it unfavorable to him? Um, because they were... Uh, in unfamiliar land, charred going across a river. That, I foot. thought it was the river that was a big point. That was a big yeah, point. Yeah, okay. river was a big deal. Yeah, and, and well, he accidentally kind of made a formation that the Persians were unable to handle with his um, rather rash charge across the river on one of the flanks. He got a partial surround Okay. and distracted the Persian forces enough to let his guys cross the river. Most of Asia Minor... Um, including Sardis, which was the local Persian capital, just surrendered without a fight. Okay, wow, that's huge. So at this point, Alexander figured that he could either wait a little bit to consolidate his holdings, or he could continue south, and he decided to continue south towards Phoenicia and Palestine. Makes sense to me. So on the road, in another very, very famous story, uh, he arrived in the city of Gordium, which is said to be the ancient capital of King Midas. And he was shown the famous chariot there, which was tied up with a knot made of bark. Okay. The legend says that whoever could untie the knot was destined to rule the world. Okay. In most versions of the story, Alexander, he couldn't find the ends of the knot, so he took out his sword and he cut through it so that a whole bunch of ends appeared and then untied it. Yep, that's what I was going to ask. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there is one other version of the story. This comes from uh, Aristobulus. Uh, he says that Alexander undid the knot by pulling out the pin that the knot was fastened to. Um, so then Alexander stopped for a little while in Kilikia. Um, he was sick, and none of his friends or his doctors were willing to treat him for fear of being blamed for his death. Okay. Eventually, one of his friends, a guy named Philip, eventually did. And he attempted to diagnose Alexander and make him some medicine. At about the same time... Alexander received a letter which claimed that Darius III had given Philip many riches to poison Alexander. Mm. So when Philip came to Alexander with the medicine, Alexander took the cup at the same time as he handed Philip this letter, and one drank while the other read. 
And Philip was at first terrified, but seeing that Alexander had drank his medicine and was smiling, he was overcome with emotion and he fell to his knees. And under Philip's care, Alexander made a full recovery and continued his campaign. Very nice. That, that's, that's gutsy. It really is. And it really shows how confident and trusting Alexander can be. And this is really one of the things that makes him a likable historical character. Uh, so now uh, Darius, who was thinking that Alexander was still in Colicia, he marched through the mountains to reach him at the same time as Alexander moved into Syria to attack Darius. So they passed each other. They both recognized this and they spun around and ran towards each other and cutting off each other's supply lines. And they met near the small town of Isis. Okay. And thus begins the Battle of Isis, which is going to be one of the two big battles I'd like to talk about um, during this story here. Okay. Because I like tactical history. Yes. As is often the case with Greeks and Persians, the Greeks were very heavily outnumbered in this battle. <laughs> Round <Yeah>. two. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to use the modern estimates for these numbers. The various contemporary historians give a couple of different uh, sets of numbers, and almost all of them are certainly inflated. This is a period of history where we really know what life was like, what the possibilities of the time were like, so it's not very difficult to take a good guess. Correct. And how yeah. big these armies were. Yeah. yeah. So Alexander had about 41,000 men. Um, that includes uh, 13,000 peltasts, which were skirmishers, spear throwers, those kind of guys. Mm -hmm. uh, 22,000 heavy infantry, his phalanx, and 6,000 cavalry. Okay. Um, the Persians had somewhere between 50 and 100,000 men. So outnumbered about two to one. Their composition is not broken down by any of the ancient sources, but we can reasonably guess that it contained about 10,000 immortals, 10,000 Greek mercenaries, and 11,000 cavalry, and the rest being Persian infantry. The Persians had 10,000 Greek missionary, I mean, uh, mercenaries? Yeah. Those dirty turncoats. The dirty turncoats. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to be talking about directions a little bit. So um, for the purposes of this battle and uh, this episode so not necessarily in the future i'm going to break the uh, tradition a little bit and i'm just going to for the sake of clarity give all directions from alexander's perspective okay that makes sense so the two armies <clears throat> were separated by a river again yes i was about to say again so darius uh he used a oddly shaped line that uh, Plutarch describes as gamma shaped, which modern English speaking listeners would recognize as an L shape. Upriver on Alexander's right, the Persians had a, a fairly large flanking force. So there was like a right angle in the Persian line sure. uh, surrounding the Greeks. So he hoped to surround Alexander there on the right, um, while his cavalry, which was lined up regularly, crossed the river and obtained a, another surround on the left. Okay. Um, and Darius was situated in the center with his best troops. So Alexander, he put his uh, small number of light cavalry on on the left to hold against the Persians, mm -hmm. and he lined up the rest of his army to match the rest. So as the battle begins, uh, the Persians lead the cavalry charge on Alexander's left, and uh, Parmenion, who will come into the story a lot because he's like Alexander's right-hand man, he, he manages to hold, and Alexander's phalanx on the right also holds against that gamma shape. Okay. So once Alexander knows that he won't be surrounded, he charges forward with his hoplites and pushes straight through the Persian right. Then he mounts up and charges straight at Darius in the center. Darius runs away, as he is wont to do, huh? and Alexander uh, turns back to help uh, his friend Parmenion, who is barely holding the left, crashes into the back of those Greece Greek mercenaries who were still on the battlefield. They break up and flee. And then the rest of the Persian army realize that Darius has left, and they run away too, and thousands are slaughtered as they run. According to um, one contemporary historian named Arian, who is our primary source for Alexander, uh, Alexander and his bodyguards once came upon a, a crack in the earth that they were able to cross by walking over the piles of dead Persians who had fallen into it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 
So there's an estimated about 20,000 Persian casualties. 20,000. And shoot. less than 7,000 Greek casualties. So so basically what, what Alexander did is he just let them line up in their L shape, and then he just advanced on each side of the L, and he held, and then he just got Darius's spirit to break after he was holding. Not quite. He he once he saw that his sides were holding, he took his his hoplites, his the Greeks fighting, you know, in the classical Greek Spartan style, yeah, the spears, and just charged straight through the Persian line. Okay, uh, near where that joint is with the L shape. Okay. Oh, that's where he charged. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that that makes and sense. And then once once he got through, he got up on his horse with his companion cavalry and charged at Darius. Gotcha. Yeah. So our, our next segment is Alexander in Egypt. And this is the part where I stopped making notes. Yeah. So after Alexander uh, sent Darius back to Persia, um, he captured Darius's camp, which contained a lot of his wealth, um, slaves, and his family, his mother, his wife, and his children now, why were, were captured by Alexander. Why were they all so close? I don't know. I guess maybe that was the practice at the time, um, to keep your family with you. Well, I mean, um, movement, military movements and campaigns uh, at this point in history were fairly slow. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Darius was out in the field for over a year before this battle took place yeah so i guess that kind of makes sense yeah i was gonna i was gonna say the same so at this point alexander more or less has the run of the levant uh he comes down he uh captures most of the countryside in in phoenicia and he takes a, a little while to capture uh the phoenician capital of tyre which was on an island at the time it's not on an island anymore interesting um, because alexander built a causeway to the island um oh and by the way i know i'm pretty sure that you don't but in case any of our listeners do watch the uh the netflix show marco polo this was one of the things i was looking for when i started my research on alexander uh that marco polo in the ninth episode says something that is certainly false and he says I'm I'm taking this as not a mistake by the writers, but as a mistake in the character of Marco Polo. He is confusing two different sieges of Tyre. He says that Alexander built great trebuchets with which he could besiege the city. But that's not true. The trebuchet wasn't invented for another thousand years. There was a Venetian siege of Tyre much, much, much later, and trebuchets were used in that siege. Mm. But uh, Alexander did not have them when he took the city, which is which makes it kind of a bit of a more of an achievement. So, yes, after capturing Tyre, Alexander went on to capture Gaza and continue to move south into Egypt. Um, at this point, Alexander, he, he had a habit of founding cities and naming them after him, right? Yep. And at this point, he founded probably the most famous Alexandria, the one that is, it, it's still fairly large to this day, I think. I'd love to see it. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. It, it Alexandria is no doubt going to become part of our story later on. So Alexander was looking for a place to found a city in northern Egypt. Uh, he found an architect whose name was Homer hmm. and gave him this land. He said, look, let's find a place to put a city here. And Homer built a plan for the city on the ground with chalk. While they were there looking at this plan of the city, suddenly down from the sky, from the lake and from the river, lots and lots and lots of aquatic birds formed on the outer ridge of the city. And they like stood on top of this plan that they had drawn out. This omen really concerned Alexander, but the soothsayers who were there told him that not to be worried about it. They interpreted the message uh, to mean that it would become a very rich and populous city. So he ordered the workers who were there to begin construction, and then he went on a pilgrimage to the temple of Zeus Ammon. Okay, who's Zeus Ammon? Zeus Ammon is one of the personalities of Zeus. Okay. So Ammon... A-M-M-O-N is, is how it's uh, spelled, is uh, the Greek spelling, the Greek interpretation of the Egyptian god Amon-Ra. Oh. So, yeah. So th this temple of Zeus Amon was a, a hybrid 
Greek and Egyptian temple to the king of the gods. So while at this temple, he was greeted by one of the priests there who didn't know Greek very well. Okay. Do you know Egyptian? He, well, he did know Egyptian, but Alexander didn't. So he, he tried to speak Greek uh, to Alexander when Alexander arrived. He, he wanted to say, my son, right? As, as priests do. But what he wound up saying was, son of Zeus. Mm, that's right. So th- this is the point where Alexander really starts to play up the myths of his divine parentage. Correct. Because now he has evidence of it from the god himself. Yes, from this priest. So from there, um, Alexander returned north to Phoenicia, uh, leaving his city in progress. And at this point, Darius's wife, who was traveling with him, dies. Okay. Well, he's upset about this because he Alexander really wants to prove his magnanimity um, by showing goodwill to his enemies and his adversary Darius who can he considers worthy okay and he's upset at the loss of this opportunity to say look how well I've treated your wife so what he does instead mm. is he gives her a magnificent state funeral okay um, everyone attends and there's lots of mourning and yada 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 supposedly there was a man who was witness to this funeral and he traveled to tell Darius the news. And Darius, uh, when he heard it, he wept, saying, Alas for the fortune of Persia, that the wife and sister of the king should not only have been taken captive while she lived, but also buried unworthily of her rank when she died. And to mm. which the messenger said, You have no cause to lament for the evil fortune of Persia on the account of your wife's burial, nor any want of respect of her. Our latest Satira, and which is his wife, and your children, and your mother, when alive, wanted for nothing, except the light of your countenance, which our lord Ormastes will someday restore to them. Nor was she treated without honor when she died, for her funeral was even graced by the tears of her enemies. Alexander is as gracious a conqueror as he is a terrible enemy. So, so then Darius uh, takes this messenger guy into private, and he's he grills him a little bit like are you really telling me the truth and the messenger affirms that yes this is what's actually happened and darius reportedly says grant that i may again restore the fortune of persia to its former state in order that i may have the opportunity of repaying alexander in person the kindness which he has shown to those i hold dearest Mm. but if the fated hour has arrived and the persian empire is doomed to die may no other conqueror than Alexander mount the throne of Cyrus. Oh, nice. Yeah. This, these were things that were said in private, but Plutarch has reason to think that they were actually said, and I think Plutarch is trustworthy. But still, I think that's one of the things in the story that you can take with a bit of a grain of salt. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. We're approaching battle time again. Good, good, good. Stop, sound the war drums. So once Alexander had uh, conquered all the country around the Euphrates, uh, he marched towards the the east, right, to to meet Darius in battle one more time. So now Darius was expecting him to come straight at Babylon. As such, he put his army in between Alexander and Babylon, and he uh, enacted a scorched earth policy. To tr- he was going to attempt to um, to retreat as much as possible, leaving nothing behind so that Alexander couldn't live off the land. Yep. What Alexander did instead, let me pull up a map so that I can see what I'm talking about, and we'll also put a map in the show notes for you guys. So Alexander captures the, he he has captured the territory north of the Euphrates, and um, in between the two rivers is where Darius's army stands. What Alexander does instead is he crosses over the Tigris and takes a big roundabout route which is more fertile land, um, so he is able to live better off of the land with his large army. And he's able to force Darius onto the back foot a little bit. Okay. But eventually, there comes a point where Alexander needs to recross the river, and Darius, knowing the spot, has a couple of days to prepare. Actually, part of the Persian history that we skipped over, there was another battle fought very near this place, uh, where Darius the Third's 
father, if I recall, won a battle that got him the throne in a civil war mm. between him and his uncle. And Darius the Third, he was going to try to recreate this battle. Smart. So what? He, yeah. So what he did was he had a few days before the battle. So what he had a very large army. What he had his army do was flatten the field. He had them flatten the field so that he could deploy his scythed chariots. Now, these are chariots that have those things sticking out of the spoke of the wheels that catch you up, right? Exactly. Okay. Now, how does one flatten the field? Do they just cut everything down, or do they literally just step on the, the wheat? They cut everything down, and um, they leveled all of the hills and filled all of the valleys so that it's totally flat, so that these chariots can just go everywhere and wreck everything. Okay. The Macedonians arrive. This is actually kind of an interesting battle. There's there's only a few times in history that we can really pinpoint the actual date that something happened. The week before the armies met, there was a lunar eclipse. Okay. So this was October 1st, 331 BC. Okay. Two days later, Alexander's scouts reported that they found the Persian army. They approached and... Uh, met on the field of Gagamila. Okay. Plutarch tells us that before the battle occurs, Darius had uh, had his men marching and staying under arms at all times. Okay. This might have been a great help for him because Alexander's generals wanted to attack the Persians at nighttime. Since they were so outnumbered, they thought that the confusion might help them mm. to win the battle by catching them unarmed but they were armed and alexander said no i will not steal a victory the ancient sources say that the persian army was between 200 and 300 thousand it probably wasn't it was probably more like 50 to 100 thousand again so going with the uh larger estimate we can expect darius had about 30,000 peltasts 40,000 cavalry the 10,000 immortals of course 2,000 Bactrian cavalry, which he brought in specifically for this, um, 1,500 archers, his 200 scythe chariots, and 15 elephants. Ooh. In contrast, the Greeks were still right around that 40,000 number, with uh, 31,000 heavy infantry, 9,000 light infantry, including peltasts and archers, and the 7,000 cavalry, including uh, Alexander's companion cavalry. So with that... I want to stop for a second and talk about how the Macedonians in this time period under Alexander and under Philip executed their warfare and their battles. The center of the Macedonian army were the Pes Okay. So these were literally foot companions or, or like foot friends. Huh? Um, <laughs> foot friends. And giving them that name. <laughs> foot friends, yeah. <laughs> giving them that name actually supposedly really made recruitment easy for Alexander. Because, like, these people, they're all my friends. Why Don't you want to be my friend, too? <laughs> <laughs> so needy. So the Pesatyroi, they were an evolution of the Greek hoplite. They used these humongous 15 to 21 foot long pikes. Okay. Huge spears. So they, they needed to be held in two hands. So they had a, sh a small shield that was hung from their neck because they, they just wouldn't be able to manage the spear and a shield at the same time. This enabled the first, like, five or six ranks of soldiers to present their spear points all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So walking into a Macedonian phalanx was walking into a wall of hundreds of very pointy things. Yes. So this was a almost exclusively defensive formation. It has strength in numbers and a very solid phalanx, but they can't act as shock troops because as soon as they break phalanx, they're much, much, much weaker. Yes. And they can't really maneuver very much, right? So, so you, what, when everybody's got these huge things and they're all pointed in one direction, you can't, like, tilt the block of soldiers that you've... you've either going forwards or backwards maneuvering was very difficult yes so this was a defensive formation so alexander had regular greek hoplites on the side who were his shock troops okay that makes sense his with cavalry and peltasts and archers running skirmishing and harassment okay good so the pesatyroi were very effective against enemy infantry and cavalry but were very very weak to enemy flanking maneuvers mm -hmm. and the other important unit is a very new thing 
in warfare that didn't exist before this time, and those were the Hetairoi, the Companions. These were a elite cavalry unit, Alexander's signature tool of battle, and the first historical use of what we would call shock cavalry. So they were equipped with the very best available equipment, the best horses, uh, they were well armored with a solid, curious, l- like the muscle armor, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> the muscle with, armor, with sh- yeah. Shoulder gu- <laughs> yeah. With, with shoulder guards and uh, open helmets so that they had good vision, but no shield. Mm, okay. They carried a copus or a ziphus sword, but the main weapon of the Hetairoi is the Zeiston, which was a fairly long spear, about 10 feet long. And it had a point at both ends hmm. with, um, yeah, the, it's expected that the extra point was used primarily as a counterweight um, and as a backup for when the spear breaks. Okay. And they attacked in a wedge formation to pierce the enemy line and pass through it in an attempt to negate a phalanx. In the attempt to negate a phalanx? Yes. So, would you charge into the center of a phalanx? Yep, and then cut through it. That's the idea. Okay, and then and then attack the phalanx like from the sides. From the sides and from behind. And that was the center of the Macedonian military science that was so effective. They, they used this, uh, what, what's, what's called hammer and anvil tactics. Okay. The Pezhetairoi, the main phalanx with the great big pikes would hold the enemy in place in a pitched melee, uh, similar to the push of pike that characterized 16th and 17th century European tactics, while the companion cavalry, led personally by Alexander, would swing around or pierce through the enemy line and crash into them from behind. And this was very, very, very effective, especially against the Greeks uh, with their regular hoplite uh, phalanx tactics. Mm -hmm. Um, So... Clearly, this hammer and anvil relied on the phalanx itself, so it wasn't a complete new change in the paradigm of warfare, but it was a new evolution within phalanx tactics. Yes. The phalanx itself would not become obsolete until about 100 years later when the Romans institute the uh, manifold system. Okay. And I'm sure we'll get to that eventually. We probably will. Now, it, it's important to note that when you're crashing through these phalanxes with these shock cavalry, it's probably super costly the, the second you get there. You know, you probably lose a lot of troops as they crash into it. But when they finally are able to establish the wedge inside, it becomes costly for the enemy. Is that correct? Um, I would think so. Okay. Yes. So the Battle of Gagamila. This battle is interesting for a couple of other reasons. Basically, what Alexander does here is genius and... It's never been done since. Really? Yes. I praise. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Um, So let's see if I can describe this in a way that makes sense. It it took me a while to grab it myself. So Darius sets himself up with um, his large numbers of cavalry in front of his main line and his chariots and elephants in front of them. Darius puts himself in the center, as is the Persian custom with his best military, and he's surrounded the cavalry and the Greek mercenaries that he still had at this point somehow. Okay. The Macedonians, Alexander divided in two. He gave himself control of his right side, and his friend, Parmenian, control of the left side, like what happened before. Mm -hmm. Alexander was, of course, with his companions. Parmenian had his own cavalry unit and so on. Knowing that they are outnumbered. The Greeks take a, I think the actual term for it is a echelon formation. Okay. Meaning that his his wings are angled backwards so that the entire Greek line is a concave. Okay. Or wait, no, a convex. Yeah. Because it was almost inevitable that they would be flanked. So might as well prepare for it now was the idea. And one of the big tricks here that Alexander instituted was he set up a second line of phalanx well behind his first and behind those wings that were echeloned back so that he could order these guys to go wherever they were uh, being pushed backwards, more or less. Mm, okay. Yeah. So so this the second line of phalanx, he used this so that he could move that phalanx to wherever he was being broken. That's the idea. Despite their low mobility. Right. That's crazy. Yeah. 
the battle opens, Darius, so with the superior cavalry numbers, attacking Alexander's left. So once again, um, I'm going to try to use all directions from the perspective of Alexander. And Alexander, in response, takes his companion cavalry and he takes the phalanx that were on the front and he just runs them to the right. Okay. It's almost as if they're fleeing battle. They, they just go straight to the right away from the fight that's happening on the left and away from the Persian lines, and most importantly, away from the level ground. Okay. Uphill or downhill? Well, the ground is all level. Okay. So Darius is now forced to send his uh, chariots and his cavalry to attack Alexander and that moving phalanx like right now otherwise they're going to be on unlevel ground and his chariots aren't going to be useful anymore so the chariots attack alexander's line was prepared for this just before the chariots slam into the macedonian line they they basically just jump out of the way in the most ordered fashion possible they open up aisles in the middle of the phalanx for these chariots to pass through harmlessly oh my god and then once they've passed through alexander sends some of his horses back to clean them up Okay. Wow. So these are the these are the chariots that have the sights. Yeah, that's right. Wow, that must have been terrifying. So now at this point, this this is the genius bit. So by moving everything he had to the right, he forced Darius to split his army, to separate okay. his cavalry from his infantry. The cavalry were trying to swing around and uh, beat Alexander to the right side of the battlefield. And so now there was this great big gap in the Persian line. Then Alexander stopped moving right and charged straight forwards with his companions and with the uh, phalanx and the pezatiroi and the w- whatever. So, and they he formed this army with the companions and the infantry into a great big wedge. And they just drove straight through the Persian line. The, the Persian infantry at this point were still in the middle fighting Alexander's central phalanx. So they weren't able to turn around and stop Alexander's great big charge. So this is the hammer and anvil mm-hmm. in use, but blown up past what how it had been used before. Once again, Darius runs away. <laughs> As he is often wants to do. <laughs> yes. And at this point, Alexander had a bit of a choice. He could have pursued Darius and captured him, which would have been fairly easy. But he got some desperate news from Parmenian on his left, which would later be used by somebody else to discredit Parmenian. They were encircled by cavalry and just barely holding on, so Alexander turned around with his companions and slammed into the enemy cavalry and won the battle on the left and followed Darius later. Okay. That's a shame. Yeah, it is. He, I think that uh, he kind of knew that that was going to... I think he was hoping that that wouldn't happen that quickly, that uh, Parmenian could last long enough for him to capture Darius, but... Yeah, you know, he, based on the way that the battle, he wasn't happy about it, but he he yeah he could either win the war right now and lose most of his army, or he could put it off for a little while and keep his his military forces intact, and that's what he chose to do. Okay, that makes sense. But th- this battle was just a crushing defeat for Darius. The Macedonians captured forty thousand talents the king's personal chariot and his personal bow and all of the war elephants. Oh. Yeah. Shoot, 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 shoot. Elephants aren't fast. Elephants aren't fast, no. They were probably pretty (laughs) easy to capture at that point. Oh my gosh, yeah, they're as fast as buildings. Yep. Um, (laughs) That's kind of what they are on the battlefield, you know? Yeah, (laughs) Um, that's awesome. So now... Basically, the westward half of the Persian Empire was in Alexander's control at this point. There, there was nothing Darius could do about that. Um, so Darius's new plan was to travel to the east into uh, the area now known as Afghanistan and raise another army to okay. defeat Alexander. Uh, he was assuming, of course, that the Greeks would go towards Babylon uh, and then eventually Persepolis. And hopefully by that time, he would have a large enough army to defend Persepolis. So he returned to Persepolis. Okay. Yeah, things getting done. Yeah. So he sent some letters to his eastern satraps saying, hey, help me out. We can still beat Alexander. But the satraps 
they had different ideas. One of them, okay. whose name was Bessus, murdered Darius as he was fleeing the battlefield. When Oh my gosh, no yeah, way. When Alexander caught up to him, he found him just lying dead in a chariot. Or in pro- probably more like a carriage. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. Something a little bit more ceremonial. Um, and then Bessus surrendered the rest of the empire. Uh, so Alexander... Now- now, do we know Bessus's motivation? His motivation was probably self-preservation. We okay. don't really know yeah, you're right, right. a lot about him because what happens next is Alexander, he's very upset about this. He makes a great big burial ceremony at Persepolis for Darius, and then he yeah. pursues Bessus, captures him. He finds four trees, bends them downwards ties one of Bessus's limbs to each of the trees and then releases them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, Bessus ruined Alexander's victory that he had earned. He really did. And um, this is the point with the death of Darius that um, history says the Achaemenid Empire is over. Alexander uh, inherits the title of Shah Nan Shah. And continues traveling eastward. And we'll talk about some of that as well as backtrack and talk about some of the things that Alexander did in private and his in, and in his interactions with other people. Try and learn something about the character of um, Alexander the Great rather than the things that he did next time. Yeah. The less important one. Yeah, the less important one. The one who dies. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert for the third episode. <laughs> oh, oops. Maybe I should cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make this so hard for myself. I'm going to hate myself when I'm editing this. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I've got no idea what I'm doing. And then correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, me and my fellow gamers that are listening to this podcast, and you too, should be wondering whether or not you have heard Amon somewhere else recently. Uh, Isn't... You mean the StarCraft 2 villain? I do mean the StarCraft 2 villain, the one that we have yet to oh. you know, really formally meet. Yeah, that one. So we are now continuing with um, the story of Alexander yep. after he took power from his father. Ripped it from his dead hands. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>